Good afternoon. I'm Dick Clay, and I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. I want to welcome you to today's program, Louisville Women in the Suffrage Movement, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment. We'd like to thank the Thomas W. Bullitt Perpetual Charitable Trust for sponsoring today's lecture. I'm very happy to introduce today's speakers, Michael Higgs and Gwen Rogers. Michael Higgs is the manager of the Cave Hill Heritage Foundation. He is a 19 year veteran of the cemetery and he oversees the long-term preservation on history within Cave Hill. Gwen Rogers is a docent with Cave Hill Heritage Foundation and she is a retired middle school history teacher. She has led group tours at many historic sites across the United States and Europe, and she has a special interest in women's history. I will now turn the program over to Michael and Gwen and then rejoin them after the presentation to moderate questions as time permits. And again, I wanna thank them for being with us today. The partnership between the Filson Historical Society and Cave Hill uh, is something of incalculable benefit to both organizations and to Louisville, uh, the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the entire region. So thank you both so much and welcome. Thank you, sir. It is a great pleasure to be here today as well. We get our presentation loaded for you. So good afternoon. My name is Michael Higgs and I'm the director of the Eco Heritage Foundation. It's our great pleasure today to present to you Louisville Women and the Suffrage Movement, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment. In reviewing the order of our presentation today, we'll first get started with a recap of what Dick stated my name is Michael Higgs. I'm the foundation manager with the Cape Hill Heritage Foundation. Along with me today is Gwen Rogers, retired teacher and docent with the Cape Hill Heritage Foundation. In our order of presentation today, we'll be talking about the history of the suffrage movement, recognizing the many leaders here locally that paved the way and made an indelible difference on the fight for the right to vote. We'll be looking more specifically at the national perspective of suffrage, and the local perspective of suffrage in covering the history of that movement. We'll look at a suffrage timeline and then also look at suffrage leaders of Louisville and then end with a general conclusion. Before we begin looking more in depth at the his entire suffrage movement, I think it's very pivotal to essentially define the word suffrage. And suffrage is defined, as we might remind ourselves, as the right or privilege of voting, franchise, or the exercise of such a right, a vote given in deciding a controverted question or electing a person for an office or trust. And Ann Taylor Allen will give her quite a bit of credit for setting the tone for the entire presentation. Because when you think about the entire suffrage movement. It wasn't something that just occurred, but rather it was part of many things that were occurring in, if you will, a precursory way. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But Ann Taylor Allen defined the suffrage movement in such a way she, where she said the suffrage movement was not only national, but intensely local, built by a large number of people and groups that worked within widely varying regional and cultural settings. So if you would keep that in the back of your mind as you are listening to our presentation, and I think that will help set the tone greatly. The entire suffrage movement itself, as I mentioned earlier, is, is not just a, a simple stagnant piece of our history. Almost as any movement in history or situation, if you look at suffrage, we view it on a timeline where the precursory elements leading towards suffrage, including three which I've highlighted here, and there are many more, but three which I've highlighted here included the free kindergarten movement, the temperance movement, 
and also the abolitionist movement, ranging from the years around 1770 through 1920 at the ratification point. And then we carry 100 years forward to the current day and looking at the implications of suffrage and what that meant. So using this particular view and using this type of model, we can then a little more accurately prescribe the elements that led up to suffrage, then define the suffrage movement between um, perhaps both a Caucasian perspective and an African-American perspective, and then see the implications of such. Now, there are many different precursory elements towards suffrage, three of which we're going to highlight today. The very first one being the pre-kindergarten movement. The pre-kindergarten movement was largely German rooted. Uh, the very first English speaking kindergarten was in Boston. Elizabeth Peabody was the director of that kindergarten. And the, the notion at that time was that the movement would be able to reach across all parts of the societal spectrum. That is, as some researchers would say, the individuals of moderate circumstance all the way through uh, perhaps even the, the future criminal, if you will. So the sweet spot was right in the middle there. And that was where the majority of, of Americans were. The kindergarten movement was rooted best in the notion of developing power and, and really forming an intellectual capacity and moral capacity within our children from a very young age uh, in, in kindergarten to have an early and lasting influence that would carry them from, from that point all the way through to their current day. The movement itself was known to be instituted in prescribing cleanliness and order and in marked improvement in speech and marked improvement in the home as a whole uh, because the entire home was affected by the education of the youth at a very young age. And, and that was a very central tenet of that kindergarten movement as well. So mothers learned how to be good mothers and fathers learned how to be good fathers, according to some theorists. One of the uh, early and, and very another leading part of that kindergarten movement was to establish a systematic habit, teach obedience, and to, to essentially develop a, a certain level of self-control that children could then institute in the balance of their life to essentially build their character. When you look at the temperance movement, now we'll add to the, to the mix there, that was a very, very, very pivotal part of the precursory element leading up to the suffrage cause. Now, when you look at, at the temperance movement as a whole, we're going back to the 1870s roughly, and you see a lot of very important people of influence from a Dr. Lewis who, was really critical in, in his speeches and in his um, capacity to gather opinions and gather people to move toward nonviolent protests. Within several months of, uh, of the wide temperance movement establishment, there were over 250 communities where uh, women had driven out liquor from a community. And for the first time, there was some sense of satisfaction or pride in which people were uniting for common cause and then working toward uh, correcting a societal ill, if you will. In 1879, Francis Willard adopted the do everything philosophy. And with the adoption of the policy, that meant that all, essentially all reform was interconnected and societal problems could not be separated uh, from other other ills. So everything had to be tackled and do everything. Uh, by 1894, home protection was, uh, was endorsed by the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And that, and, and, then, and, and then we started to see where they were adopting uh, the mindset towards suffrage as well. So they were promoting causes and, and at that time, and the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union was the, among the first organizations to maintain a professional lobbyist in Washington, D.C. The WCTU was also instrumental in um, becoming and getting women more and more involved in politics as well. 
Uh, Willard, for example, pushed for the home protection ballot, arguing that women being the superior sex morally needed to vote to act as citizen mothers and protect their homes and cure society's ills. Switching gears to the abolitionist movement, we're going back to the beginning of that timeline, which we highlighted in the earlier slide, in which we are looking at early prohibition of the importation of African slaves. Slaves were introduced in Jamestown in the 1600s. As early as the 1770s, Virginia and Delaware began to curb certain practices, that is the prohibition of the importation of American slaves. The Constitution pro prohibited the importation of slaves beginning in 1808. However, the catch is that it did so without using the word slave or slavery. Slave trading became a capital offense around 1819. 1833 in Philadelphia, you see the first American Anti-Slavery Society convention convening. Stepping forward a little bit in the, uh, in the, the entire timeline view, then we look at the suffrage movement and we see that as a movement that was split in, in many ways. It was not a, a harmonious uh, movement as, as some would project, uh, but there was quite a bit of, of split between Caucasian efforts as well as African-American efforts. I think the thing that really bound everything together was the realization of unification of voice and the benefit to that. We're looking back to, to Ann Taylor Allen, there were some things that she had drew from her research that really women at that time had to realize in order to be quite effective. One was the capacity to formulate an agenda. Number two, the capacity to build a coalition. Number three, the capacity to draft legislation. And number four, the capacity to persuade state and local governments to pass it. Those were four elements that as a whole, regardless of Caucasian or African-American institution in the movement, those four elements had to be realized, and I think that can still be seen today, especially when we're trying to find uh, a nature of advocacy. Even Carrie Chapman can't emphasize the necessity of harmony of method. The chief need was organization at that point. So looking at a national effort at suffrage, I'm just gonna point out just a few things here on the timeline, on the national timeline. In 1776, you have the New Jersey Constitution of 1776 adopted which allowed all residents who owned a specific amount of property to vote. Coming back or coming forward 1840 to 1848, then we start to see the Declaration of Sentiments with Seneca Falls, huge, huge part of the history of suffrage. Moving forward, uh, you see in 1866, the American Equal Rights Association uh, being formed to advocate universal suffrage. Mind you, there was something in there called the Civil War around 1861 to 1865 that kind of got in the way. 1868, we have the 14th Amendment passed, which essentially provided qualified citizens the right to vote. Caveat, didn't include women. 1870, the 15th Amendment was passed, which prohibited the exclusion from voting on the account of race, color, and previous condition of servitude but we were still reeling with Jim Crow laws that were being passed to disenfranchise uh, black and poor white men uh, to have the capacity to vote. Moving forward a little bit more in 1896, see the National Association of Colored Women, found, or Woman founded. Uh, and so we're seeing bits and pieces. And even 1890 with the uh, NWSA, AWSA, and in 1903, the Women's Trade Union was established to argue for suffrage as well. Moving forward in 1909, you see the NAACP, an advocate uh, for suffrage on the African American cause, uh, and that is also involved some Caucasian support as well. Uh, in World War I occurring, 1914, you see a huge suffrage uh, event in Washington, D.C. in 1913 as well. Then stepping forward through the timeline, 1919, the Watchfire for Freedom. June the 4th, you have the, uh, the Senate passing the 19th Amendment and the race to ratification began, but then not until, even though we had, had an amendment, it was not until 1965 
with President Johnson with the Voting Rights Act that truly prohibited racial discrimination in voting. So even though we were at a point of amendment passage, it took a whole lot longer to, to make an even more indelible difference for the rights of voting. 1964 was civil rights, huge part of this puzzle. And in 1984, the last state to ratify the 19th Amendment, believe it or not, was Mississippi, 1984. Here's a progression of suffrage across the United States. You can see uh, the timeline there associated on the state. Looking at suffrage in Kentucky, we'll dabble across a timeline looking at the very beginning in 1838 with Kentucky as the first state to adopt suffrage or universal suffrage law where female heads of household could vote in elections deciding on taxes and local boards for the new school county common school. In 1867, the first suffrage organization was founded in Glendale, Kentucky. 1877, you see the State Association of Colored Teachers formed in Kentucky, was the first in the South, I will point out. 1883, uh, you see Mary Barr Clay uh, into the picture with the American Woman Suffrage Association. Stepping forward, you see Hera and then Lyra being founded in the late 1880s. Moving through the timeline in an expedited way, now, around 1903 to 1908, the Kentucky Association of Colored Women's Clubs that founded in 1903, 13 clubs, 180 members. That was pretty pivotal uh, at that time. 1894, Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs founded as well. And then uh, as you step into the timeline after Laura Clay, and then we uh, will also mention uh, another pivotal person within Kentucky, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge out of Lexington as the president of the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. 1920, Kentucky became the 23rd state to ratify the 19th Amendment, and uh, which said the right of citizens uh, of the United States to vote shall not be denied or bridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. Moving into 1920, and when Merle signed the bill giving women the right to vote. Uh, and then in, with the Kentucky Equal Rights Association uh, becoming the Kentucky League of Women Voters. So we see a lot of major things happening both at a state and national level that really made a formidable difference. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Gwen Rogers to discuss the Louisville suffrage leaders. Gwen. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm honored today to share with you some of our leading suffragists uh, here in Louisville. Of course, there are many more. Time prohibits uh, very many, but I'm going to touch on some of the uh, highlights. The first Louisville suffragist in our presentation today is Bertha Parr Simmons Webby. She's perhaps best known as Louisville's first African-American policewoman, but she was active in a variety of local causes. As a young woman, she was one of six graduates of the very first class of uh, African-American kindergarten teachers here in Louisville. Um, uh, but Webby served on the board of the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA, and she was instrumental in providing services and training for African Americans in Louisville. I'm sorry, I forgot to advance that to you. I'm used to teaching in the round, so this is quite different for me. Webby was also a longtime contributor to the Urban League. This is an organization dedicated to economic and social justice for African Americans, and she was honored in 1959 for 25 years of service to the Urban League. Webby married Ellis D. Webby, a physician and one of the founders of the Louisville Red Cross Hospital. This was a hospital in Louisville that was staffed by African Americans, doctors and nurses, and that served the uh, black community here. Webby helped train nurses in the hospital and she saw, uh, chaired the women's board of the hospital. Unfortunately, Webby felt that she had to resign 
from the police department in protest after the only other two African American police officers in the department were dismissed by a newly elected city administration. Our next suffragist is one who has considerable name recognition in Louisville. She's Susan Look Avery. Susan Look Avery and her husband, Benjamin F. Avery of Avery Plow Works here in Louisville, were early proponents of equal rights for all because they had freed their slaves actually 20 years before the Civil War. After her husband's death, Avery became an outspoken proponent of suffrage and eventually she became a leader in not only local suffrage, but in uh, Kentucky and national as well. When Lucy Stone, the founder of the American Woman Suffrage Association came to Louisville in 1881 for the, the AWSA's first convention below the Mason-Dixon line, she stayed at the home of Susan Avery. And in time, Susan would, uh, Avery would become friends uh, with various suffragists and reformers, among them Susan B. Anthony, Booker T. Washington, Sojourner Truth, and Jane Addams. In March of 1889, a small group gathered in the parlor of Avery's home at 4th and Broadway to organize a movement intended to raise the status of women and to gain the vote for them. It was the first meeting of the Louisville Equal Rights Association, later to be named the Louisville Woman Suffrage Association. And I understand that this is a bit of an alphabet soup. Um, that's the hardest thing about studying the suffragists is keeping all of the different organizations straight, but I'll try to help do that as we go along. In 1890, Avery became one of the founders of the Women's Club of Louisville. Its first 39 members met in her home for the inaugural event. And what a difference that club has made uh, within the city of Louisville and in our state. She and other Louisville women helped to sponsor bills in the Kentucky legislature to give married women the right to control their own property, to make wills, and to retain custody of their children in the event of the death of their husbands. And when I conduct tours in Cave Hill and we stop at the, the grave of Susan Look Avery and I tell, particularly tell the young people about these events, they're astounded. How could this ever be? that when a woman's husband died, she doesn't get to have custody of her children. They're, uh, they're astounded at, at, at this. And so I use that as an opportunity to say, this is why we needed women's suffrage. Um, a firm believer in hard work, her favorite aphorism was, it's bad for the ignorant and the vicious to do ill, but it is worse for the educated and the honest to do nothing, surely words for our time. Caroline Aperson Leach became one of the earliest suffrage supporters uh, here in Louisville after moving here and marrying a banker, James A. Leach. She became a suffrage supporter through her involvement in the Women Christian Temperance, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, uh, which worked not only to prohibit the sale and consumption of alcohol, but to address the social problems resulting from alcohol abuse, um, such as domestic violence. Uh, WCTU leaders believed that the Bible supported gender equality and that the enfranchisement of women would benefit mothers and families and purify society. Leach was one of the first members of the Louisville Equal Rights Association, and she provided her home as a meeting place for them. Uh, this group worked to pass laws that gave women the right to serve on school boards and laws that regulated child labor, established uh, reform school, and created juvenile courts. In 1914, she spoke in favor of a motion to support women's suffrage at the National Convention of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, um, an overall umbrella organization for women's clubs across the nation. 
Uh, here, the Federation formally endorsed suffrage. It created a major uh, news event, a uh, national news event, and Leach later described this as the proudest moment of her life. Leach was a leader in many local reform efforts, including campaigns to improve schools, uh, health services, promote sanitation, eradicate tuberculosis, plant trees and gardens, create playgrounds and parks, and, and also to abolish slave uh, labor, a uh, child labor. She was involved in so many different aspects of social progressive reform in Louisville, and she is truly one of the stalwarts of the um, suffrage movement. Highlighted as our next suffragist is Patty Blackburn Simple. Patty Blackburn Simple was one of only a few leading suffragists who encouraged African American women to register and vote after Kentucky granted women, at least those who were literate, the right to vote in local school district elections in 1912. She was unusual in that here in Kentucky and in much of the South, many argued against women's suffrage because extending the vote to women also meant that black women could vote as well. As a member and one time president of the Louisville Free Kindergarten Association, she promoted literacy among African-Americans and supported efforts to train uh, their teachers. She wanted to make kindergarten classes available to African-American children throughout Louisville. Uh, in 1893, Semple founded Semple Collegiate School, a college preparatory school for young girls, and is the forerunner of today's Louisville Collegiate School. Uh, she was active in organizations, too, that gave scholarships to uh, young women who wanted to pursue a secondary education. In addition to her work as an educator, she was the co-founder and first president of the Women's Club of Louisville, founded in 1890. And she was also the first female trustee of the Louisville Free Public Library. So deeply committed to a life of service. Another dedicated and innovative, oh, did I forget to change that for Patty Blackburn Simple? I'm so sorry. I'm letting down on my job here. Another of our dedicated and innovative Louisvillians was Lena Levy Takau. Uh, as a member of the Louisville Woman Suffrage Association, the LWSA that you see there, and chair of the Legislative Committee of the Women's Club of Louisville, Lena Levy Takau encouraged women to register and vote following the 1912 expansion of school suffrage. Um, she helped to organize a telephone campaign, which was quite innovative at its time to reach new voters. Uh, one of my uh, favorite projects that she has is she collaborated with a former teacher, Sarah uh, Webb Mowry, to make uh, nutritious lunches available to all public school students because the women explained that the students wanted to go out on the street and purchase pretzels and pickles and ice cream. Uh, for lunches, and then as now, I guess, young people prefer junk food. Uh, so she and Ta um, Takao and Mar Mari convinced the Louisville Superintendent of Schools to introduce a program uh, that provided nutritious lunches for a penny, and that eventually happened in 29 uh, Louisville schools. They co-authored a book, A Penny Lunch, that described their system and included a number of their really successful recipes so other districts could replicate uh, their success. I'll remember to change it this time. Our next featured suffragists are, uh, are grouped because they're actually a family. Uh, Georgia Ann Nugent and M uh, Alice Emma Nugent, Molly Nugent Williams, and Ida Bell Nugent P. These four sisters are typical of many Louisville African-American suffragists whose parents were born uh, during slavery, but who worked hard to provide a better life for their children. In 1896, uh, Georgia Nugent, a teacher for more than 48 years, helped organize the Women's Improvement Club, 
which focused on training African-American women as kindergarten teachers. And she helped form and was the first president of the Kentucky Association of Colored Women's Clubs, uh, which supported efforts to promote women's suffrage and education of the newly enfranchised. Uh, choosing a less visible role was Georgia's sister, Alice. And uh, Alice Newton taught, Nugent taught high school here in Louisville for many years in the colored system and was active in many church and civic organizations. She was also a longtime member of the Kentucky Association, Association of Colored Women, and she wrote the group's official song. Another sister in this family of suffragists was Molly Nugent Williams. She chaired the executive board of the Kentucky Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And the last sister, um, Ida Bell Nugent P, lived and taught in Louisville until she married a physician, Andrew Lyman P, and moved to Virginia. So all four of these um, remarkable sisters are buried close together in uh, one of our Louisville cemeteries, and you can visit uh, their graves today. The suffragist Mary Virginia Cook Parish was known for her powerful intellect, her writing ability, and her rhetorical and business skills. She was born near Bowling Green, Kentucky, where despite a limited formal education, she was invited to teach in a private academy because of her intellectual aptitude. Uh, supported by admirers of her abilities, she was educated in New England and at Louisville State University, which today is um, Simmons. She graduated at the top of both her normal school and her college class in 1887, and by 1892 was on the faculty of Eckstein Norton Institute, which was a, uh, an industrial training school for African-Americans located in uh, Bullitt County. She later married Charles H. Parrish, a minister and the president of Simmons University. Uh, Parrish went on to establish the first parent-teacher organization of Louisville's colored schools and co-founded the Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA. In 1892, Parrish joined a group of black women in Frankfurt to protest a proposed state law requiring the segregation of uh, railway cars. And she was given time to speak about that issue before the General Assembly. Uh, beginning in 1921, she was an early delegate to the local and state Republican conventions and served as an alternate to the Republican National Convention in Chicago. Uh, another of our better known suffragists here in Louisville was Eleanor Tarrant Little. Eleanor Tarrant Little was among a small group of suffragists who made an effort to reach out to African-American women and encourage them to register and vote in the local uh, school district elections. Little and her husband, Presbyterian minister, John Little founded Presbyterian Colored Missions, which provided educational and health services to African-Americans. Earlier while studying and working as a teaching assistant at the University of Chicago, she found her calling, which was to improve education for children of all classes and races. She saw suffrage as a way for women to use their voting power to bring about this change and other changes. In Chicago, Little observed the settlement houses and she was inspired. These were inspired by the social reformers such as Jane Addams and their role was to improve education and social services in poor and immigrant neighborhoods. So in 1897, when Presbyterian minister Archibald Hill founded Neighborhood House, which was the first settlement house in Kentucky, he asked Little to become its director. And this Neighborhood House was located at First and Walnut, which is now Muhammad Ali. Uh, her work included reaching out to the community that during those years was made up largely of Jewish immigrants um, who were fleeing um, the uh, anti-Semitic violence in Russia. 
So she spent much of her time making home visits, these house calls to see how these families were doing. It was said she often made as many as 50 calls in a morning. I don't know how you do that. I think I would have a hard time making 50 phone calls in a morning, but she must have been a most energetic lady. At a neighborhood house, Little Amanage, little managed among many other things. It was obviously a very busy place. A kindergarten, a nursing service, a public bathhouse, a circulating library, classes in English and in vocational skills, and a tutoring program for children. Once at a conference, uh, Eleanor Tarrant Little was introduced as the one who has maintained a lighthouse in the darkest district of Louisville. Adelaide Schroeder Whiteside was a longtime principal in the Louisville public school system. She's credited with establishing the first nursery school in the South. She also helped initiate three kindergartens in Louisville and formed the committee that created the first public playground here in Louisville at Brook and Walnut Streets. She was a renowned orator and she used her public speaking skills to promote a variety of educational initiatives as well as a women's suffrage. In 1915, with women's suffrage on the ballot in New Jersey and in New York, uh, these were uh, state uh, amendments to state constitutions. She delivered 178 addresses across those states in the support of that, those amendments. And while in New York, she also took part in a pre-election uh, suffrage parade and she carried the yellow Kentucky suffrage banner. She later joined suffragists in Washington DC to speak in favor of a national suffrage amendment. Whiteside along with Eleanor Tarrant Little and Patty Blackburn Simple encouraged black women to vote in that school election in 1912. It was those three who led that movement. A formidable orator and a timeless worker for progressive reform, Whiteside is surely one of Louisville's most nationally visible suffragists. Uh, Rebecca Rosenthal Judah is our last suffragist in the presentation. In 1912, when literate Kentucky women gained that right uh, to vote, uh, Rebecca Rosenthal Judah led a committee of the LWSA that encouraged qualified women to register and get out and vote. Um, this, committee, this committee did a, a, a very novel thing. They went to factories and places where uh, women were employed and they asked for permission to um, put registration slips into the, woman's, the women's pay envelopes, uh, thus encouraging the working class to register and, and get out to vote. And, and she sent many of her committee members to African-American audiences to speak. So on election days in 1912 and then in 1914, she and her colleagues got out the vote by telephone. They sent cars to pick up people and take them to the polls and they supervised polling places so that the uh, voters would not be harassed. Uh, in 1913, she was a delegate to the annual convention of the Kentucky Equal Rights Association and was elected treasurer of that, um, of that organization, the only Jewish woman among the officers. After Kentucky won the right to vote in 1920, she helped found the Louisville League of Women voters to educate those newly enfranchised women. Her husband, Jacob B. Judah, was an, also a member of LWSA. Uh, he often helped her by hosting um, uh, pro-suffrage events at his department store. He was manager there, uh, Kaufman Strauss, which uh, many of us, I'm sure, still remember when I was a little girl, it was Kaufman's and enjoyed going there. Rebecca Judah's other volunteer activities included founding and serving as the first president of the Louisville branch of the National Council of Jewish Women. She also served on the board of Neighborhood House, uh, a settlement house that's still located here in Louisville 
in the Portland neighborhood. This is our uh, sources slide for our presentation today, since I have included our overview of Louisville suffragists, our logo for Cave Hill. Uh, I know we have only addressed, uh, we've only hit the highlights of uh, this, these suffragists, and there are many hundreds more here in, in uh, Louisville. Uh, we simply could not, did not have time to address them today. So I thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to Michael. Hey, thank you, Gwen. Uh, so kind of round out the presentation today, when you're thinking about what you just heard about, you think about the individuals who contributed to, to the suffrage cause, uh, you see, the complexity of the forerunning elements that led up to suffrage. You see uh, from the pre kindergarten movement to temperance to abolitionist movement, and then you see suffrage and you see it from the angle of both the African-American movement as well as the Caucasian movement. There are a lot of moving parts to that. And there are a lot of things that one may prescribe uh, were, if you will, areas of implication. Uh, from suffrage. And some of the areas of implication from suffrage, we could probably point to, let's say three uh, as a whole. And so areas in uh, implication from suffrage, let's point to gender, education, and then public welfare. When you think about the terms of gender and the implications of suffrage and what that meant, we look at that from a very general lens and look at the advancement of women as a whole because of the suffrage cause. You see women advancing in society. You see an authentication of place and culture, an authentication of place in society because of the suffrage cause. Uh, you see as a whole, stepping forward all the way through the current day, a little more equality in the workplace that, that is occurring. It's a gradual element of impact from suffrage uh, that one might attribute. And then taking a little more in-depth look uh, at some of our more recognizable and recent uh, individuals you see perhaps Sandra Day O'Connor and even Ruth Bader Ginsburg and their appointments to the Supreme Court. Two pivotal appointments, two women that were in pivotal roles that made a huge difference as a whole on society. Looking at education from the lens of suffrage, you see the implications of suffrage and, and education by looking at the treatment of the whole family uh, that is from a very young age all the way through and try to set roots with children in a very young age setting, that way the entire family can get better. I'm reminded of two particular theorists in education, which I spent a lot of time studying uh, as an undergraduate, especially Paulo Freire and Donaldo Masado. And they provided a very pivotal quote that said essentially, Education is the practice of freedom by which men and women deal critically with reality and discern how to participate in the transformation of their world. You see that wrapped around that notion of emancipatory literacy, a huge gain. We are having the right to read that prescribes the right to have influence and make decisions. From the terms of public welfare, we see implications of elements that were already in existence as suffrage was occurring. Uh, for example, looking at the, the Red Cross and Clara Barton and, and her involvement and movement, and that was her, her work with the Red Cross was even further strengthened of the suffrage cause. She herself was also a suffragist. Uh, you look at even more locally, Sister Emily Cooper and the Dyson movement. Um, that's predating 1920 and the passage of, uh, of the amendment. However, one might argue that it suffrage strengthened uh, the capacity of her role in public welfare. Uh, you look at all the auxiliaries and the, the fundraising that was, that was occurring for the betterment of the public whole because of the impact of suffrage. Women could do more, they gained a whole lot of right and responsibility and therefore that led to a tremendous, tremendous impact for us as a whole. 
at this point, um, we're going to move forward. And Mr. Clay. Welcome again, everybody. And thank you both, Mike and Glenn, for just wonderful, wonderful presentations. There are some questions here, and I'll start with Dennis Jennings, who says, this is very interesting. Besides Louisville and Lexington uh, in Kentucky, where else would you have considered the suffrage movement to have been started or centered? That started or centered in Kentucky or in relationship to the rest of the nation or? I'm not sure, but why don't you answer both of those? I, th I think first uh, Kentucky and then the rest of the nation. Oh, in, in Kentucky, it began in Louisville uh, for a, a, a number of reasons. Uh, it began actually in Lexington, but it was a more rural, um, small town elite based um, organization and not until it moved to Louisville did it really gain enough momentum to take off. Louisville was the largest city. Um, we had a, a large population that, that could uh, push that movement. We of course have always been a city of immigrants. Uh, the reform movement was popular here, but where am I looking? Oh, the camera. Um, it, the reform movement was popular here because we had so many uh, educated women, professional women, doctors, lawyers, teachers, um, who cared a great deal about assimilating these immigrants into the nation um, and, and teaching the women and, the, and their families uh, about being a good American. Uh, and immigrants, of course, to paraphrase Alexander Hamilton, they get the job done. <laughs> could, um, they were creative, that created new strategies, the new tactics that began to be used all across the nation. Um, they were so creative and we had, there's a religious element that plays into that as well, rather than the small town, rural, uh, bootstrap Protestantism, that you, the individualistic uh, do it yourself kind of thing that you get in much of the rest of the state, even today. Um, there was an element here of let's help people through the Catholic Church, the Jewish uh, synagogues, the, um, the Jewish community centers, the, the Presbyterian churches, the Episcopal churches, the Unitarian churches, a sense of we're responsible for others. Let's make this a better community, a better state, and a better nation. Does that answer the question? If you National Center on New York was heavily, New York and Washington, D.C., heavily invested in the movement. And uh, of course, there were several states, uh, Washington State, um, uh, Iowa, uh, Utah, California, that began to have Western states gave more suffrage uh, earlier than, than the Eastern states. Does, does that answer the question, I'm hoping? Yeah, it definitely does. And I'll add to it, and that is Stephen Brown suggested uh, in the chat room, check out the National Collaborative for Women's History website, mm, okay. uh, which will we'll cover this in, in even greater detail, I, I'm sure. Excellent, excellent. Then also, um, this, and this is a beautiful thing, Nancy Chazen, of the National uh, Council of Jewish Women, the Louisville section um, has said in the chat room that the National Council of Jewish Women, Louisville section is proud to celebrate our 125th anniversary this year, thanks to Rebecca. Really? That's, that's wonderful. I need to smile. Right? I hate yeah. it. That <laughs> smile. It, it. I just hate that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Then Kyle Brewer uh, asks, why did the Louisville Equal Rights Association change its name? Okay, uh, the, the, they wanted to, to make their focus the, the suffrage. They thought that everything else they were trying to do could be accomplished through that vote. They, they, they saw that in the reform movements. Once a group came to a, a, the Louisville mayor and said, 
we have this reform that we want we want to get through and he said just how many votes do you ladies have <laughs> well they soon soon figure out that you don't have the votes then a lot of these things are not going to happen so they changed it to louisville um, women's suffrage association to match the national um, designation of national american women's suffrage association and they focused on suffrage as opposed to some of our sister states in the south who had a different function. that's that's a great thank you and then kyle has another question how did the temperance movement lead women to participate in the suffrage movement certainly I mean, you had this entire philosophy of with temperance where people were essentially very early on women were, were given a platform women were exercised with a very distinct focus, they learn how to organize. Yes. They learn how to gear in on a particular subject. And that really, that base really made a pivotal impact. Uh, the do everything philosophy uh, was one in which women themselves viewed not only alcohol, but suffrage or any element thereof as a part of the whole house. And if they were going to make a difference, you can't make one change and just think everything else will follow suit. You have to adapt to the entire family mindset. So in order to make the most tremendous impact, you must affect the whole. And to affect the whole, then you can move forward. Got it. Um, here's one from Ed Fredrickson to everyone. Uh, Charles Chilton Moore was the editor and publisher of Lexington's Bluegrass Blade newspaper uh, and was a vocal supporter of women's rights and liberation. Uh, that paper uh, was published from 1884 to 1910. Uh -huh. I might ask you all, were there other male publishers uh, or editors um, or were there particular male politicians who were vocally, aggressively, unequivocally supportive of the women's suffrage movement? I, I do know that there that here in Louisville, Robert Worth Bingham um, originally had his editorial uh, board oppose suffrage, but then came around after that gener that. Um, uh, the General Federation of American, the Women's Clubs Federation, um, after they endorsed suffrage, then he and other civic leaders began to move to support suffrage and the editorial board uh, promoted suffrage from then on. Um, we do know other editors or and some of the prior to Robert Worth Bingham were not quite so supportive to put it in just a nice language. I uh, probably should just leave it at that, uh, but they were not. And uh, men in general just saw it as the, uh, seemed to have found it to be the, the, the death of the American home. If women gained, um, uh, gained suffrage, you could just look on something as, as um, blase as Pinterest. And you just put it on Pinterest and say woman suffrage and look at all the nasty things yep. right. that bubble up from from that that soup of of um, it seems like pure hatred of women getting uh, the vote. Yes. But here in Louisville, uh, the businesses came around, the the uh, editors came around and and helped women gain the vote. But it would not have happened had it not been for Louisville's leadership because we were the ones who had the uh, had the population had the had the women who could push and see it through had that a horizontal um, uh, immigrant woman working woman educated woman network that worked throughout uh, Louisville and Kentucky and uh, ultimately the nation to get it passed That's we right. were formidable Exactly. You know, in the suffrage movement itself, when you look at how it was moving across the state of Kentucky and you look at the, the contributions of Madeline McDowell Breckenridge and Mark Clay, mm -hmm. you know, they were doing two different things. They had two different polar opposite perspectives. You were hoping, for example, with one, 
one had a perspective of collecting dues and 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 keeping it in, in kind of um, a dues-based organization where then we began to see there was a little more value in the collection of signature and in, in getting signatures and looking at the impact of strength in numbers that way. People didn't want to pay to belong to an organization, but they would sign their name to a cause on a cause card. So, you know, there were very philosophies across the leadership, with, even within the state of Kentucky. And you think about some of the, the African American influence as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you, when I think about, even if, for example, the individuals that we highlighted in the in our presentation today, uh, there was a lot of influence in education with African Americans. Uh, you think about we we kept referencing uh, what we now know as the Simmons College, and the and the influence that came of higher education. And in the impact that that had by women, especially after work, African American women leading a cause for higher education, because education was one of those things that if you don't have it, you're going to suffer. And there was a huge impact there on that side. And that's a heavily undertold part of the story, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we've got just two more minutes. So let me. First, uh, this is from Stephen Brown. 150 years ago this past Tuesday, Colonel John H. Ward represented the three defendants in police court who were attempting to bring a federal test case to integrate the city streetcars. Mm -hmm. In 1881, Colonel Ward was um, uh, vice president uh, of the founding of Kentucky Women's Suffrage Association. I think I read that. It says, yeah, I think I read that correctly. Do you all have any familiarity by any chance with Colonel Ward? Uh, I do not. No, he, he was the founder of what, Kentucky? Yeah, well, or yeah, he says 150 years ago, this past Tuesday, Colonel John Ward, uh, represented the three defendants in police court who were attempting to bring a federal test case to integrate the city streetcars. And then oh. in 1881, Colonel Ward was VP at, at, at founding of Kentucky Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the Kentucky one. I'm familiar with the Kentucky Equal Rights Association that that Kentucky had. So, but as on my tours, I always learn new things. Well, there you go. And so, and and like, I mean, that's, that's the best yeah. thing. I think definitely you and and Stephen Brown can uh, email back and forth. Sure. I would love to. Wonderful. And then um, we also let me make it clear to everybody, this lecture will be posted on the Filson YouTube page. Uh, just go to uh, www.youtube.com slash user slash Filson Historical KY. Now also, uh, a, a shameless plug for our friends <laughs> and all of you, uh, and also for the Filson, um, there is, a walking tour of Cave Hill. And there's a booklet that can be picked up at the main entrance to Cave Hill Cemetery. Uh, and- If I can interrupt, there's a suffrage tour and there's a notable women of Cave Hill tour. Ah, uh, ha, ha. Join and those two. How many people, <laughs> how can they we'll visit the grave when, of Susan Look Avery. <laughs> when, how can they find out when that's offered? Um, they they will be online. They're on our um, on our website um, on Cave Hill Cemetery website. Unfortunately, we're not doing those for the remainder of the year. They will start again in April May timeframe of next year, COVID willing. Uh, so we we just don't know right now. But they're fun tours. We we have a good time. Well, I, I want to thank both of you again on behalf of the Filson Historical Society 
uh, and in celebration of our partnership, collaborative partnership with Cave Hill. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm thank smiling. You. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and thank you for your wonderful questions. Bye. Thank you. Have a great thank day. Thank you.